We are in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And we're going to be studying verses 2 through 16 this afternoon, this evening. We have a culture that we're living in. Um, when we go to the Christian culture, if you will, and when I say Christian, I'm not talking about believers. I'm just talking about the, the Christian church, people that say they're Christians. There is a sect of them, a group of them, where the gifts of the Spirit are exploited. One of the problems that the church in Corinth had was they simply did not understand the gifts of the Spirit. They were utilizing them in a way that they shouldn't be utilizing them. And that thought and the things that they were doing back then are carried all the way through to today. Some people still read some of these passages of scriptures, get them all goofed up, don't understand what they actually say, and they uh, have just a complete misunderstanding of the gifts of tongue and the, the gifts of healing and what they were here for when we get to those um, sections. We will dive into why they were there and what they were used for and uh, how it applies to us today. But the, the unfortunate thing is, since it is being brought uh, into the church and kind of was in the background for a while, but is really kind of being brought to the forefront of the church in many places, people will say, if you have not experienced some kind of miracle, if you have not experienced some kind of special revelation or supernatural revelation, we all experience uh, uh, spiritual revelation if you're a believer but a supernatural revelation if you don't have some kind of impulse or feeling or some kind of experience or you hear a voice then you're disconnected from the Holy Spirit and there are places that will tell you if you have never spoken in tongues you're not a Christian you are going to hell because that is the proof that you know God that you have the Holy Spirit in you they need some kind of supernatural proof for that and it does cause some anxiety because if someone can say to you you don't have the holy spirit and here's the proof for it then according to our knowledge if they could really prove that to you you got a huge problem don't you because if they could say to you you don't have the holy spirit and then prove it to you then you're not a believer and you are lost and dying and going to hell so that is a real problem because of that then there are some people in some churches and some places that have moved from the source of knowledge being the Holy Spirit through the Word of God or with the Word of God to feelings and the Holy Spirit. And I would contest that they're not really experiencing the Holy Spirit. They're experiencing something else, maybe a demon. It's possible. Demonic activity is probably greater than we know here in America. We... Um, kind of gets glossed over, I think, because uh, I think Satan works differently here in America than he does in other cultures throughout the world as they're more sensitive maybe to uh, the demonic forces and the things that they're doing. They just works in a different way because of uh, the, our culture. It requires him to work a different way than it does with other cultures. So it's very probable and very possible that these, periods, that these people can be experiencing a demon with their worship and all of those feelings and things that they're talking about is nothing more than demon activity. The Holy Spirit delivering messages to man becomes more important to them then than the Word of God. And if they're getting a message from the Holy Spirit and it's new revelation or it's against what the Bible says, I will tell you it's demonic activity. It's not the Holy Spirit. It can't be the Holy Spirit. It flies in the face of what the Bible says. Now you see, the mark of a true Christian is that he loves the Word of God. He loves the truth. Psalm 119 says that it's sweeter than honey in the honeycomb. It's more precious than gold. Yes, much fine gold. Psalm 119.97 says, Oh, how I love you your law the work of god in the life of the believer is to generate or will generate a love of scripture there's no doubt about it if you have the holy spirit it will generate that love you will want to know what he says you will want to know what the bible says because the holy spirit wrote it 
and he is God, and that's how he speaks to us, through the written word of God. But I want you to know it has to be in internal. These people make everything so external that they, they walk around and do the, all these showy things, and they, and they say that they're this, and they say that they're that, but there's nothing going on internally. The believer has that relationship with the Holy Spirit, and it's internal, and he loves the Word of God. Second Thessalonians, I want to read that to you real quick. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 10 says, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. There in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that's a picture of the coming of Christ and the final judgment. And judgment falls on those who do not love the truth. Why? Because those that love the truth are the believers. Everybody else hates the truth. They're against the truth. The whole world's going to tell you that what you know as truth and what you love is nonsense. And this passage of scripture that we're going to get into today is really going to point that out to the world. By the way, when God saves somebody, he saves them from their sin. And because he saves them from their sin, then when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you hate your sin and you hate sin and you love righteousness. The world loves sin and hates righteousness. We're the total opposite. So a believer hates their flesh and loves Christ. They hate error and they love truth. And it's the truth that's contained in Scripture, by the word, by the way. But the world becomes consumed with having everything that this world has to offer. And so the truths of Scripture makes no sense to them. And they don't want to have any part of it. And their truth supersedes biblical truth. And the crazy thing about it is, if you look at our world today, it is a product of their thoughts and concepts and their um, attitudes and everything that has to do with them. And look at what a mess we have. If you think this world is good and grand and utopia, you're living in a different world than I am. <laughs> you know, we can have a little utopia, right? We can know a little bit about heaven. We can experience some of what heaven is. But that's through the filling of the Holy Spirit and, and experiencing a little bit of what eternity is going to be like. But until we're out of this mess, we will never really know. And at the same time, do you remember when Jesus got down to wash the disciples' feet? Is it feet? Mm -hmm. Foots. Mm -hmm. All their feet. feet. <laughs> There's, there was a lot of feet to be washing at that time. <laughs> but he got down to wash their feet, right? Yeah. And when he gets to Peter, Peter says, No, uh, I don't want you just washing my feet. Wash my whole body. Jesus says, Your whole body doesn't need to be washed, just your feet. You know what that's in reference to? He's saying, Peter, you already know. And to us today, that's like us being a believer. We're a believer. We've already been washed through what Christ has done. But guess what? We walk around in this world, and this world is nasty, and it's filthy, and you get some of it on you. You need your feet washed. You need to confess your sins daily. You need to get the world off of you. Because it's nothing but nastiness, and that is man's wisdom. It's just filthiness. And that's what this world has turned into. And so we have these places that are giving into the world. They're agreeing with the world. We have churches that are welcoming the world into their church. They're saying the world is part of their church. They don't care about anything as long as they're growing. They're not calling sins sins anymore. They're allowing you to decide what is a sin and what's not a sin. It doesn't make a difference what Scripture says. As long as you feel like it's not a sin, then it's not a sin. And as long as you have some kind of certain feeling, then you can do that. And it's all good because God is all good. So if it makes you feel good, it's fine. Don't worry about anything. And that's the world sticking to them, not getting any of it off. So when we came to 1 Corinthians in chapter 2, in verses 1 through 5, 
We saw that Paul was saying that he, he came to speak to them, but he didn't come as some great orator. He didn't have all these fancy words to say. Now, I think Paul was highly intelligent, one of the most intelligent men of that time. He knew the Old Testament law inside and outside, backwards and forwards. Unlike most of the men, he sat at the feet of Gamaliel, and, and that's why it made him such a, a, a great uh, uh, speaker and being able to talk with the, the leaders of that time because they could say, well, the Bible says this, and Paul would say, yeah, but you know what it means? <laughs> Let me tell you what that means. And he knew it better than they did. But at the same time, he's saying, listen, it's not me. I'm not the one doing all this. I'm not trying to trick you with all kinds of great stories and get you to do things because, you know, we have this story that I'm going to tell you that's so amazing. It's, it works on your feelings and it works you up and it works you into a frenzy and we get you to do this and that. Paul says, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to have any part with that. Because you know what real power is? Nothing that I say from here. No story that I can come up with. What I say is nothing compared to the words of God that are right here. And that's why I tried to read the verses to you, tell you what the verses say, and maybe give a little illustration to help us understand some, but I just want to take the words of God and give them to you straight. And when there's passages of scriptures there that make me uncomfortable, I don't want to preach on them, I still do it because they're there. And we have to, and we should talk about it. And we should know exactly what it says. So what was Paul's message? Christ crucified that's what we found in those verses so now when we come to verse number six look at what it says how be it we speak wisdom all right we're speaking wisdom how do you know when i speak wisdom and you know what you can speak wisdom too memorize a verse of scripture and quote it you'll be speaking wisdom more wisdom than any man of all time has ever had. Quote the Bible. I had a friend on Facebook years ago get mad at me because he said, all you do is quote the Bible at me. <laughs> they get mad because the Bible is truth. And they have no way to argue most of the stuff that's there. And so they're like, yeah, but I don't think I want to you know, apply it to my life that way. Well, that's fine, but you're arguing with God, not me. You can have tremendous wisdom. Know what the Bible says. How be it we speak wisdom. And you know who understands that wisdom and takes it in as wisdom? Among them that are perfect. <laughs> Who's the perfect? <laughs> They're talking about a believer here, right? This is through the eyes of God. This is the righteous. This is those that know the Lord as their perfect, uh, as their personal savior. In a spiritual sense, we're perfect. We won't be perfect till we get to heaven, but we've started that life of perfection. And when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you are perfect. Problem is, we get mad and sin, and the Holy Spirit's not filling us at that time, right? So, who accepts this wisdom? Who do we speak wisdom among? I speak wisdom among you because we're believers. Yet, not the wisdom of this world. So we speak wisdom. What I'm saying here to you tonight, will some college professor hear it and say, wow, that guy is wise. Heavens no. And probably even at a Christian university. Because they get too smart and then they know more than the Bible does. They will say he's foolish. Because the world doesn't believe any of our wisdom. They think our wisdom is foolishness. We look at them and say, how foolish are you? All you got to do is accept the Lord as your personal Savior and you'll go to heaven. And they look at us and say, how foolish are you? You think a guy came to this, to this world, he was God, he died on the cross, and then he rose from the dead? How foolish are you? Right? That's exactly what they'll say. So we don't speak the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world, 
That's in reference to Joe Biden. Uh, because he's our president. He's the leader of our country, right? So that's what the prince is. That's who the political powers are. We don't speak the same wisdom they do. Our wisdom is way different. They have nothing but foolishness. The only time they have wisdom coming out of their mouth is when they agree with the word of God and when they apply the word of God to what they're saying, which is very seldom. Nor the princes of this world that come to naught. Their wisdom comes to nothingness. It's empty. Verse number seven. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. This is very strong language here in verses seven and eight. And Paul says, we are speaking the truth. It's wisdom, but it's not your wisdom. It's not my wisdom. It's not man's wisdom. It's God's wisdom. That's the only wisdom that counts. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. What is a mystery? A mystery in the Bible is something hidden that is now revealed. We read mystery novels, and you've heard me give this illustration before. You start reading the novel, and as you go through the novel, they give all these twists and turns, and you think, oh, the butler did it. And then, oh, no, the maid did it. Oh, no, so-and-so did it. Oh, well, maybe the butler did do it. Oh, no, look at what this person's saying. And finally, at the end, it's revealed, right? And you're like, ah, oh, I knew it all along. After you changed your mind five times, you say that, right? I knew it. Well, that's what he's saying here. It's been hidden from them. They had the Old Testament law. They thought something was going to happen. They got it wrong. They didn't understand this age of grace that we're in, this church age that we're in. It's being revealed through the apostles, through the Holy Spirit. They're writing it down. That's our Bible today. This wisdom is being revealed, and it's the mystery of God, and it's being revealed as they write it down. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. You know what? No matter what happens, God knew it was going to happen. This age of grace that we're in right now, God knew it was going to happen. This isn't a surprise to him. The fact that Jesus died on the cross is not a surprise to God. Many prophecies in the Old Testament about it. They just didn't want to believe that that's how it was going to happen. This time that we're in isn't a mystery to God. He knew it. What's coming in our future is not going to surprise God. He knows it all. So we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. If you know the Lord as your personal Savior, you're giving glory to God. You know when you receive the most glory? It's simply when you work in the power of the Holy Spirit and God receives the glory. You're just his instrument at that time. Verse number 8. Which none of the princes of this world knew. Man can't know it. The powerful can't know it. Jeff Bezos doesn't know it. Elon Musk doesn't know it. Doesn't make a difference who you are. They didn't know it. For they, for if they had known, now listen to this, these are, he's really speaking to the Jewish leaders of that time. Those people, the most powerful people of the world didn't know what this mystery was because if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They would have understood the mystery that's being revealed through Paul and the other apostles at this time. They wouldn't have taken Christ and crucified him. Now, he would have still been crucified. He needed to be crucified. It would have just happened a different way. God would have supplied. But this was God's will. This was God's way. He ordained it. It was before the foundation of the world, and he knew exactly who would do it. He let it play out that way. Verse number 9. But as it is written, this is taken from Isaiah, 
Eye hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. All that God has prepare, prepared is unavailable by worldly research. The world's not going to come up with it. They're not going to find it. The believer, however, has the truth inside of him. It's not going to come from external things of this world. It's going to come through the Holy Spirit. And it's prepared for them that love him. Verse number 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. This is revelation. God hath revealed it. Revelation. Revealed them unto us by his spirit. How did we get the Bible? How did we get to understand this mystery? Through the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's God. The Holy Spirit used the apostles. The Holy Spirit used them to write down these epistles so that we have them today. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Well, how can the Spirit search the deep things of God? Because the Holy Spirit is God. So he knows who God is and everything about God and knows right into the deepest parts of God. We might not have it all written down for us because we would not understand what we're reading. We can't even come to scratch the surface of how deep God is. But the Holy Spirit revealed to us what we need to know and he revealed to it in a way that we can know and understand enough about God to become a believer and go to heaven and understand this mystery that we are in. Now, verse number 11, if the Holy Spirit is the one that wrote those things down and understands the deep things of God, verse number 11, for what man knoweth the things of a man? I look around here, what do I know about you guys? I know little bits about you, right? But I don't really know deep down inside of you, do I? I can't see into your heart. Now, I can see some of your actions and I can get an idea about your heart. And I can understand a little bit about you, but I can't really know who you are. I can't know what's going on inside of that brain of yours. You can be sitting there fooling everybody. God can look in there and see and know, can't he? But I can't do it. So he says, what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him. You know who knows what's inside? You know what's inside of you. I know what's inside of me. I know what goes on inside my brain. It'd probably scare some of you if you knew what was going on inside of my brain. The things I think. The ideas I come up with. Good thing I don't uh, make them all auditory all the time because it would be scary. That's who knows. But look at this. Even so the things of God knoweth no man. Who knows the things of God? No man. And by the way, I will tell you that without God and without the Holy Spirit, man would never come to God. He would never even come up with the idea that there's a God. Because man is about himself. And that's why we have humanism and all the other religions around the world. He wouldn't come up with that. So who knows God, the things of God? No man does. Who does? The Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit knows all about God. He knows everything there is to know about God. And you know what's amazing about that? He knows everything about God, and he knows everything about you. And so does Jesus Christ, our great high priest. It's an amazing thing that is put together. I don't know how he can know everything about me and then also know everything about you. And the person down the road, the other person, and the next person. 7.27 billion people on the earth, I think I read the other day. A lot of people for him to know everything about, isn't there? They can do it because he's God. Verse number 12. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world. 
So this is the inspiration then. You have the revelation in verses 10 and 11. This is the inspiration. We haven't received, we have received, not the spirit of the world, which is good. What's the spirit of the world? That's Satan. That's humanism. That's everything about man. That's everything filthy you can think of. We haven't received that. The believer hasn't received that. He might have at one point in time, but not now. But the spirit which is of God. When you come to know the Lord as your personal Savior, the Holy Spirit comes into you. He takes part of your life. He is in you. You receive the Spirit of God. That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Man cannot know God. Man cannot understand God. Man would never even conceive God. But guess what? The Holy Spirit does. And the Holy Spirit's in you. That's inspiration. This is divine. He's talking about truth. Inspiration is taking revelation and putting it to words. Look at verse 13. Which things also we speak. So Paul is going to tell you the things of God. Paul is going to tell you the wisdom of God. Not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, Again, going to get away from man's wisdom because it's nonsense. It's what our world is. But which the Holy Ghost teacheth. That's what Paul's all about. That's what we should be about. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. We should be concerned about spiritual things. We shouldn't be concerned about the worldly things. We shouldn't be concerned about all the things the world has to offer. And we've got all these wars going on. We've got the fighting in Ukraine. We've got fighting all over the world. We've got things happening here. We've got things happening there. You've got Argentina's a mess. You've got all these different places. Things are happening all over the world. And we're concerned about spiritual things. We're concerned that man's soul will come to know the Lord as their Savior. One of the places I worked at, not currently... Uh, came around wanting us to give to United Way. And I said, no, thank you. I'm not going to be involved. Boy, did they want to put pressure on me. Mm -hmm. Why? Do you think it's no good? Doesn't make a difference if I think it's good or not. Doesn't make a difference if I think it's good. I want my money to go towards spiritual things. I don't want it to go to the things of the world. So I didn't give to the United Way. And, and that person let the whole office know I wasn't going to do it. Hmm. And I didn't care. <laughs> I was giving to my church. I wasn't a pastor at the time. I was concerned that my money would go out and see others come to know the Lord as their personal Savior. That Bibles might be translated into people's natural language so they can read it and understand it and come to know the Lord as their Savior. Yes, there are some pretty cool things that they might do. Pause with a cause. Yeah, there are people that might get some help from that dog. And that's okay, I guess. But I'm more concerned that they know the Lord as their Savior than that they would train some dog to help out some kid. And I know that might sound bad. <laughs> but I want that kid that's involved with pause with a cause to come to know the Lord as his Savior. And someone needs to reach out and help those people out, don't they? We can help out people help out people physically all the time that doesn't mean anything we need to reach out to their spiritual being see them come to know the lord as their savior so we compare spiritual things with spiritual now verses 14 through 16 we have illumination but the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of god so here's our progression right we have god Man can't know him. Man can't understand him. We have God's wisdom. It's higher than man's wisdom. Man will never understand God's wisdom. Man will always fight against God's wisdom. I'm a man. I can't know anything about that because I don't have the Holy Spirit. Well, how do I get the Holy Spirit? I pray to accept the Lord as my personal Savior, don't I? So the natural man that does not have the Spirit, he receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Why? 
because they are foolishness unto him. They hear what God did and they say, that's foolishness. I reject it. And when they do that, they reject the Holy Spirit, which means then that they still can't understand God and will never understand God. It is the Holy Spirit's work to draw a man to God. It's one of the things that he does. He works in their heart. Look at the end of verse 14. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. You know what the world wants? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, everything that is listed in this Bible. If everybody would live out the words in this Bible, we would have a tremendous world to live on. It would be great. But instead, man says, I have sins that I love and I want to reject the Bible. So go take the Ten Commandments out of your courthouses and get rid of the Bible and get rid of churches. Why? Because they love their sin, which means they hate the Bible. And in doing that and getting rid of the Bible and getting rid of spiritual things and getting rid of, and getting rid of spiritual people, if you will, they just cause a bigger mess on this earth. <laughs> They lash out at people that are good citizens. And they help out people that, in my estimation, are not good citizens. <laughs> I let them run all over the streets, do whatever they want. Verse, 13, verse 15. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is not judged of man. Now that is an interesting thing, right? Unregenerate people, they look at Scripture it's meaningless. Someone that knows the Lord as their personal Savior, that is filled with the Holy Spirit, he looks at the world through the lens of the Holy Spirit and the Bible, and he judges it. Not that he's telling people, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, because that's God's job, right? But what he sees is what the world is doing, and he's saying, that is not what the Bible says. Look at what a mess you're making of this world. That's him judging it. But guess what? He himself is judged of no man. They may try to judge him, but it doesn't make a difference. You can throw that man in jail. Someone like Watchman Nee, tremendous man of God, loved God, served God, gave himself for God, and was thrown into jail. And once he was thrown into jail, then he started writing letters and penning letters and, and it got out somehow. They tried so hard to make sure his letters wouldn't get out. They wouldn't let him have paper. They wouldn't let him have pens. They, they wouldn't let him contact with people. And yet somehow his letters still went out <laughs> to all the people. And people were reading it. And tremendous uh, things happened from his writings. You can't stop the word of God. You can't stop what God's doing. You can throw the man in jail. But what judgment is that? Still going to heaven. You can behead me. Big deal. I'm still going to heaven. I'm not judged of any man. I'm judged of God. Look at verse 16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Man does not know God's mind. The only way to know God's mind is to know God, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But you know what? The end of that verse, we have the mind of Christ. The world tries to instruct God, they can't do it. It's foolishness to try to instruct God. But we have the mind of Christ. Why? Because we have the Holy Spirit. And you know what? The world and what they're doing is foolishness to us. And it should be. And at the same time, we are foolish to the world. But when it comes to eternity, they're going to be mighty sad. For eternity. Oh, they might have the things of this world. They might have things that look cool. They might be living a lifestyle that looks so fun and exciting that it usually does not end up good for them anyways. But it might look that way on the surface. Know the mind of Christ. You will know what a little bit of what eternity is going to be like. And that's what's going to matter in the end.
we can speak wisdom because we have the words of God. Let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message that you gave to us, this chapter, all about the world's wisdom and God's wisdom. How we know what the truth is and the world doesn't know anything about it. I pray, Lord, that as we go out into our world, that we can share the wisdom that is inside of us through the power of the Holy Spirit, that people can see you living in us, that we can be great examples of who you are in this world. Father, now we just ask these things in your name. Amen. All right, we do have.